So um, uh, let me just sort of tell me uh, or introduce myself. So I'm a computer scientist with background in machine learning. Um, I'm one of the people who here in London organizes the London Machine Learning Meetup. So I'm very, very passionate about machine learning. Um, in a previous life, I was, a, um, I was doing most of my development on the sort of the Microsoft stack. And I was one of the founders of the math.net numerical library, which is kind of like the NumPy in the .NET world. But as I moved jobs um, and joined the data science team at uh, RangeBand, which is the startup that I work for today, and I've sort of made my way into the Python world and have enjoyed it very, very much. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is um, the first project that I did when I joined this startup RangeBand. So very, very quickly, um, what, our, what our company does, our startup does, is uh, we're an e-commerce company. Um, we have a, a catalog of products, and we have an order processing system, and we try to help big retailers like Tesco and Asda and Argos here in the UK to sort of scale their range. So what that means is Tesco would come to us and say, look, range band, we'd like to sell 500,000 books that we don't have in our catalog. Can you help us? And then we say yes. We give them the product data. Um, they send us orders and you know from people, and we ship it to those people. We deal with the returns, etc. So, you know, in this kind of e-commerce uh, world, there's a lot of you know interesting machine learning pro problems to tackle. And so, one of the things that we have is a uh, sort of a search engine that we give to the retailers, uh, where they can make their selection and say, look, you know, I want to. Um, you know, have a bunch of um, you know electronics, audio, um, audio components that I want to sell. And well, RangeBand has seventy-five thousand of those, um, and so the retailer goes to that and they say um, they select those. They say they create um, a short list and they launch them. Now, sort of the key bit about this is that the a lot of the navigation um, that people use on this search engine um, and the way kind of retailers think and organize their um, their teams is according to product categories. And so, one of the really important things that we need to do is across the you know hundreds of millions of products that we have um, or that we know about, we need to categorize them. Um, and so when I uh, joined RangeBand, um, we had, uh, you know, there was a, I was, you know, one of the very early technical people. And so the uh, the people that were already there, the way they went about categorization is, you know, they just contracted it out to, um, um, you know, Mechanical Turk um, or to sort of companies in 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 countries, you know, with lower wages, and just had people manually label um, label products. So you know, they'd see an iPad and they'd say, oh, an iPad is electronics, computer equipment, tablets, you know, etc. Um, and it seemed like this was a very good opportunity as kind of like a first project to tackle and, and automate this. And so essentially what the problem was that I was going to solve a few years ago was we have a product catalog. Um, it's structured as a tree. Um, it has about uh, 4,000 nodes in it. Uh, about 2,800 of those are leaf nodes. There's about 21 top level categories like electronics, clothing, toys, etc. And every product that you can think of needs a category in this uh, hierarchical structure. The good thing was that because you know I joined a few months few months after the company was founded, that you know there had been humans labeling products you know for a while before I joined. So there was a, 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 was a great data set for me to start with. Uh, however, there were also hundreds of millions of products that hadn't been classified. Um, so there was still um, uh, you know, a, a big challenge. So I'll walk you through um, the sort of pipeline that I've built for this. Um, and again, this is sort of work from three years ago, so there's things that I might do differently, but, um, uh, you know, and I'll touch on, on that. But so the, um, uh, the first bit, um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, um, is uh, the kind of what I did for the feature extraction stage. So, you know, at the top we have products and our products are sort of, you know, the way we get them by crawling the web or from our suppliers or, you know, they're sort of semi-structured text. So, you know, we have sort of a key, like the name of a product, the manufacturer, description, which might be null, um, and we might have a label. You know, humans might have actually said to us already what this product, uh, which category this is. Um, and you know we do, I do, we or we did standard things like you know we did text cleaning. Um, uh, we did um, we built our, our actual feature features that we use are unigrams and bigram features on the uh, on the text. And then the one interesting thing um, that we actually built sort of a, a little bit later on, but which which 
dramatically um, improved performance was we sort of added um, LDA topic features. So on every product, um, we looked at the item name in the description. We ran a top topic model over the hundreds of millions of products that we have. Um, that topic model is, is completely unsupervised, so we can do that for the labeled and unlabeled data. Um, we train a topic model that had, I think the one in production has 50 topics, um, and uh, we choose all the topics that um, uh, have sort of have a probability higher than, I don't know, uh, 0.1 or something. Um, and we add those kind of IDs of those topics as extra features. Um, and one of the things that has helped uh, us quite a bit with this is this, uh, this Python um, uh, GenSim library, um, which uh, you know, is, is a great library for doing topic models. It, it, does, um, it has implementations of sort of stochastic variational inference. So it's, ve it's very, very fast. Now, I, like I said, I didn't want to spend uh, or I don't want to spend too much time on the feature extraction, um, but I kind of really want to talk to you about um, you know, how we set up this kind of hierarchical classification task. So I'm going to talk to you now about you know, how we train this model, how we you know, test it, and how we do the labeling. Now, hierarchical classification is, is kind of an interesting, or uh, you know, is an interesting problem and, and one that I hadn't sort of um, touched on before I, I tackled this project. And there's really two ways you can go about, um, about hierarchical classification. Sort of the simplest way you could go about it is by taking your hierarchy. So in this case, there's sort of a root node. There's two top level categories, A, B, and C. A and C are actually leaf nodes in this case, and D and E are you know, child categories of the, um, of the B category. Um, and so one thing you could do is say, you know, look, I'm just going to forget about the fact that I have a, a, a hierarchy. And I'm just going to flatten this, um, this hierarchy. And I'm going to create a five-way, or well, a four-way classifier um, that uh, just, you know, I'm going to train it. And the, 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 my supervised, or my, my uh, labeled data that goes in, you know, it, just a training point with label A, C, D, or E. And you, know, you, could be, you could put up for debate if you want products to be, um, to allow to be able to sit in an internal node of the tree, then you know you could add B as well. Um, I mean, some hierarchical classification tasks, you know, require you to label straight down into the leaves. So that's one way to solve hierarchical classification, um, and uh, it's it's very easy because now you can take your favorite multi-class, you know, classifier, you know, throw your data at it, and, and your problem solved. Now, for you know a small hierarchy like this, it probably would be an, a wise thing to do. Um, uh, because it just simplifies things quite a bit. Now, if you have kind of a large hierarchy um, and sort of R's with you know 4,000 nodes is, I guess it sits somewhere in the middle. You know, there's even you know just much much bigger hierarchies. Um, then you know having a, a classifier that ha you know needs to classify among 4,000 or discriminate among 4,000 classes um, or you know even more. Um, you know that that that's not a great idea. Um, and I'll touch on this, this problem in, in a bit. Um, so, you know, the alternative is, um, okay, well, for every internal node of the tree, um, I'm just going to create a classifier that says, you know, look, if I know, well, at the start, you're at the root node. Um, if the first decision I need to make is, you know, am I in, in, in subtree A, subtree B, or subtree C? If you're in A or C, well, you're done. If you're in subtree B, well, then you train, just, you train another classifier. Um, and in that classifier is you know, a binary classifier and just decides whether um, you're in subtree D or E or in, in leaf node D or E. So now you train two classifiers um, and, um, uh, and you, know, you, you kind of use the structure of the problem a little bit more. So why is this, um, uh, so, so these are the two choices that you can make and I'll touch on, on that uh, a little bit towards the end because um, it's an important decision you need to make. Um, we, and sort of in the rest of the talk, we sort of, we went for this particular solution just because, you know, I, uh, you know, we, we had a, a tree with 4,000 nodes. We allow products to end up in all the nodes except for the top level category nodes. So, you know, 4,000 minus 21, um, uh, nodes. So, you know, we, we thought that, you know, using this structure would, would have been, would have been, would be the right approach. Um, so this is what we're going with for the, for the rest of the talk. So then the next problem is, OK, well, um, you know, which classifier am I going to use? Um, and to be perfectly honest, um, uh, I personally, or the, the, the main motivation um, for making this choice is you know, finding a 
classifier where um, you know all the work we put into feature engineering could you know could really benefit uh, from. So um, a classifier where you know we um, so 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 the classifier that we end up and a classifier that supports multi-class because you know our tree is not a binary tree so we need to be able to support. Uh, multi-class classification and and you know so we ended up choosing logistic regression but to be perfectly honest you know I didn't try very many other ones logistic regression is just a very very easy one um, that supports multi-class and you could just throw any features at it and it's it's fairly good at figuring out which features are important so we went with logistic regression and just kind of as a as a as a you know for those of you who aren't familiar with logistic regression it's it's the simplest model ever. Um, so imagine you have a particular word, uh, a particular document, um, and the words in that document are cartridge, Samsung, black, and ink. Um, uh, that sounds like it might be a printer ink um, uh, product. Um, so now you, um, and you already know that it's somewhere in the printer sort of leaf, and there's sort of two options. It could be printer ink or printer hardware. Um, now there's two classifiers, the, 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 or the classifier in this printer node, um, has uh, parameters for you know the printer ink uh, label and parameters for the printer hardware label, um, and these are the values. And the way the um, the classifier works is very very simple. You just look at all the features that are you know available in your document. So cartridge, Samsung, black, and ink. So the and printer they're not in our document, so we ignore those. You literally just sum up all those values. So you know, for uh, printer ink, you say 4.0, 0.5, 0.5, and 5.0. So you get a value of 10. Um, for printer hardware, you get a va value of minus 0.6. Um, and then you simply you know, exponentiate those numbers. So you definitely get two positive numbers. You normalize them to one, and you get probabilities out. So, and that's kind of crucial is uh, for you know, what's going to come later, is we wanted to get probabilities out of every, every sort of local classification. Um, for every subtree, we want to get a probability out. So in this case, you know, not surprisingly, you know, if you have the Samsung black ink cartridge, let's say that was the document, it's quite likely that it's printer ink, and this particular classifier, which I you know, made up, um, uh, says you know, with 99.9% probability, um, it, this is printer ink. Um, so that's what, that's what the logistic um, uh, you know, regression does. Um, you know, in, in equations, this is what it does. So it literally, you just sum up all the features that you find in your, uh, in your documents, you exponentiate them, normalize them to one, and those are your probabilities. So, okay, um, so we take that, uh, we take this logistic regression classifier. So this is the model. This is how, if you knew the parameters of the um, classifier, this is how you would, you know, get your probabilities out. Um, and so now you have to um, actually figure out the, these parameters, these, you know, these beta parameters in, in, in this equation. So you need to figure out the, um, uh, the, the parameters for your logistic regression classifier, and there is a wealth of tools out there that can help you with this. Um, so what these tools generally do is um, they look at the, the they, they, they kind of optimize a particular objective function. And the objective function for logistic regression, what it c consists of sort of two components. So the first component is you look at all your docu are you labeled documents, you um, take a particular set of parameters, beta, um, and you look at the probability that um, these parameters beta give to the labels of your documents. And you know, for some reason, you know, you you take the logarithm of those of those probabilities and you sum them up over all your documents. So that first bit essentially says, you know, given this parameters beta, how good are they um, in in classifying your labeled documents? Um, so that's sort of your error, and you want to minimize that error. Now, the sort of bit that comes um, that comes um, or that generally people add to it is you know you want to make sure that you don't overfit your classifier. So you want to make sure that the parameters that you choose are not too finely tuned to the data that you're given. Um, uh, and generally the way people do that is by making sure that those parameters are as close to zero as possible. So you know by default you sort of assume that um, a word doesn't matter to a particular classification task and you really have to have strong evidence from your data to make sure that parameter goes away from that. So there's sort of two um, um, what people generally call regularization terms that you add to this optimization problem. And so these, uh, these, you know, th this software um, uh, tries to solve this mathematical problem and it'll give you these parameters which then you, know, you can plug in and you can start classifying documents. So the, um, 
the, there's sort of three things uh, that's sort of interesting to know about doing this. Um, first of all, you know, there's some sort of hyperparameters. There's some, um, this sort of lambda 1 and lambda 2, which essentially mean, you know, how strongly do you want to cons constrain or regularize these parameters? How strongly do you believe that they're all zero? Um, how strong, how much data do you need to see before you're convinced that, you know, the word cartridge, um, you know, probably means that you're talking about an ink cartridge and not ink hardware. Um, so you have these, you, you've sort of introduced in this mathematical problem, you've introduced these extra parameters that you, you know, somewhat need to choose. Um, and you, know, you, could, you could ask yourself, well, is there another mathematical problem I can solve to, you know, to choose the best ones? But um, the, uh, uh, generally what people do is just literally, you, know, you just try a whole bunch of these parameters, and we call them hyperparameters, you just try a whole bunch of those. Um, you check on a certain test set you know, how well each of them do. Um, and then you go with the best ones. So, um, so, so what, that's essentially what we do. So we just try, you know, I think in, in our production system, we try 20 of these values and we sort of adjust them over time, but we try 20 of these hyperparameter values um, and uh, train our models with these 20 numbers and just look at which one does the best. Um, the other thing, um, uh, or sort of the one thing that I kind of want to point people to um, is, well, again, I have to say this is, this is from a few years ago, and the software that, that we used, um, I think, is, is uh, poorly known in the community. So there's this piece of software called Wapiti, um, which is written by um, uh, a, I think, a PhD student in Paris, um, which is, you know, it's, it's exceptionally good um, uh, software for two things. Well, one, sort of its main purpose is for sequence labeling. So labeling, you know, sentences or, you know, sequences of data, um, which is not what we do. Um, but if you just forget about the sequence, you can actually just use it as logistic regression. Um, and it's extremely well written. Um, it's vectorized, you know, it's C, vectorized C in, um, code, um, extremely fast. Um, it's, uh, you know, we've sort of found a few bugs, but, you know, they've kind of, you know, they've been, they're extreme, or the guy's extremely quick with iring them out. Um, and so, you know, I can highly recommend having a look at this piece of software if you need to do sequence labeling or logistic regression. I think right now, um, and there's a lot of other options available, you know, like the scikit-learn toolkit has, you know, great support for that. You know, at back then, um, this is kind of what I, uh, what I found and what I, w which I trusted quite a bit. So we use WAPIT to solve this mathematical problem. WAPIT gives us models back, and a model is essentially just sort of a choice of the, uh, of the numbers that I sort of showed here. A model is literally just for every word and every um, uh, possible label, um, kind of a number. Um, and WAPIT gives us these back, and you know, that's, that's, that's what training consists of. So how do we go about this kind of in practice? Well, OK, so this is, this is the ID now. So we need to train one classifier for every internal node in the tree. So the way we do that is sort of logically is we take our tree, and I've sort of simplified it dramatically. So imagine there's just the root node and there's two um, internal nodes, the electronics node and the clothing node. Um, and we've got our data set sitting on top. And so the first thing is we take sort of every data point and we sort of drop it down the tree. And let's say this is a, this is a data point that is, let's say, an audio cable. So it sits, in the, sits somewhere in the electronics um, subtree. So we spread it around the tree. And um, that data point, that document, is going to give us one label, uh, label training point for the root classifier. So it's gonna, we're going to use it to train the root classifier to you know, distinguish between electronics and clothing. So you know, we, create now, we create two data sets. Uh, one for the root classifier and one for the electronics classifier. We're going to take that data point and sort of copy it in those two data sets. Similarly, um, we take a next data point. You know, again, it's an electronics data point, so we you know, spread it around all the classifiers that we need to train. Uh, we take a third data point. This is a clothing one. You know, again, we spread it around. Um, it provides a, a training example for the root classifier as well as a training example for the clothing classifier. Um, and we do that with uh, oops, we do that with our whole data set. So what we've essentially done is for a for every training point that let's say let's that sits let's say five levels deep in the tree, we've sort of copied it five times. It provides a training point for the root classifier, for the first layer, sort of top level classifier, second layer, third layer, fourth layer, and that's it. So we go and sort of copy our data points and sort of spread them spread them around every internal node of the tree. 
and then we're going to train a classifier for every internal node of the tree. And I'll come to how we do that in a second. So that's kind of the main mechanism, logically, and I'll again come back in a, in, in a little bit how we do that physically in, in code. Um, okay, so we have made a choice of our class for our classifier, logistic regression. We're going to have one for every node in the uh, internal node in the tree. We have kind of a, a logical scheme, an algorithm, if you want, um, for spreading our data set uh, or deciding which training point is going to um, go into which um, uh, classifier as you know for training. Um, so now we need to go and um, train these um, train these classifiers. And there's sort of two numbers that we then go and look at um, at, at a first sort of at a first stage. So we train every classifier and we do two things um, to sort of, to, there's two numbers that we look at to see how well they, uh, how well the classifiers work. Um, so the first thing, which is, I mean, both are, are very, very standard, but just to recap, um, first we do cross-validation. So, you know, let's say the root classifier and we have, uh, you know, I think we probably have about a million data points, um, training data points in our root classifier. Um, we split those million data points up in chunks of 200,000, 200,000, 200,000, 200,000. Um, so um, we split them up in five chunks. We train on four chunks and test on the fifth. We train on chunk one, two, three, and five and, ch and test on the fourth chunk. We train on one and two, four and five. We, we test on the third chunk. We do that for every chunk. So every chunk is in the training sort of set four times and in the test set one time. And every time, you know, we compute on that sort of little local test set, we compute an error. Um, so we get sort of five errors um, uh, and we average those. And, you know, that gives us a kind of an estimate, um, um, an estimate of our, um, of our, uh, of our total error. We, uh, so that gives us an estimate for every local classifier of the error. Um, and then, you know, there's another number that we look at, which is, you know, if we, what we want, so the, the accuracy is one thing that you might be interested in. Um, another thing you might be interested in is, uh, well, if you, if the, is that the probabilities that your classifier comes up with are actually correct. So if, you know, you take all the data points for which your classifier says with 0.9 probability, um, uh, I think this is in category one. Well, then if you look at all the, tr all the points that you know, it assigned to 0.9 probability, you want about 90% of those to be correct. Um, so that's what it's called calibration. That's another number that you can compute for every classifier. Um, and so we look at those numbers um, and get a sense of how well our classifier is doing. And particularly, we look at the cross-validation error to decide which, um, say, across different hyperparameters, which um, um, uh, classifier that we want to go with uh, in the future. So, okay, so now we have all these local classifiers and now the question is, well, how do we actually label um, uh, an actual product? So now we take any product um, uh, that we ha don't have a label for, um, we send it to the root classifier and the root classifier says, you know what, I think it's 90% electronics, 10% that it's a clothing product. All right, so we do brute force, we go down to the electronics classifier and now we ask, you know, we already know or we assume that you're electronics, what probability are you audio, video, uh, computers, tablets, accessories, whatever. That classifier says, I think 90% audio, 10% video and 0% you know, um, everybody else, and sort of we, we, we let the sort of data points go down the tree like that. So that's essentially using Bayes' rule. Um, uh, sort of every classifier gives us sort of one chunk of the probability, um, and we do the greedy thing. So we go down one path of the tree um, uh, to, um, uh, to, to label these products. Now, why is it so crucial that we sort of get these probabilities um, get these probabilities out. Like I said, you know, we have a lot of people labeling things. Um, and one of the things that I want to do is, you know, I, want to, I wanted to keep growing this data set so our classifiers get better, but I wanted to use kind of, you know, our automation, this machine learning technology, to also help them, uh, the humans sort of label the things that, you know, are most important, the things, you know, which, which would make the, the, the most impact to improving the classifier. So one of the things that we did was uh, with it so, some active learning. So kind of the picture that I like to paint is, let's say you have a, a classifier, uh, the root classifier, and it needs to decide between electronics and clothing or between pluses and minus. So in the top left corner, you know, this is a, this is a, 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 
a great case. So you have a bunch of unlabeled data points, the black dots, you've got two red dots, um, a blue cross. If you need to train a classifier, it's pretty, pretty easy for the classifier to figure out you know, where this, the line is that divides up the two classes. So that's sort of the nice case. Uh, unfortunately, you're, you know, the world's not always that nice. Um, and you might be in that case. Um, so you have a classifier, but now you have these two green dots, which are very, very close to the, to the classification boundary. Um, you know, it might be that you know the the dot on the left is actually a red one, and the dot on the dot on the um, on the right is a blue is really of the blue class. And so you know, if things are close to the decision boundary, well, that probably means it's a good one. I mean, you really don't know what's going on, so it's probably a good one to ask a human about. Um, similarly, you might have sort of um, a decision boundary, sort of the flat line, and you have sort of a data point way out, which would correspond to say it, it's described by words that your classifiers have never seen. In that case, um, you know, it's, again, it's probably a good data point to ask about. You know, if the first time you know, a, a Vuvuzela was put on the market, you know, our classifiers didn't know what Vuvuzelas were. They, we'd never sold any um, you know, because we'd never seen the word Vuvuzela in a description. So um, you know, labeling that once um, and saying that Vuvuzela is, I don't know what you want to call it, a toy, um, uh, that, you know, that helps the classifier a lot because you do that once, maybe twice, and for, you know, for the future, your classifiers know that Vuvuzela are, are toys. So you know, by looking at you know, how close or how um, uh, sort of not knowledgeable the classifier is, you can make a very good decision about uh, which, which data points you should send to humans for further labeling and improving your classifiers, and which data points you, know, you probably shouldn't, shouldn't be bothered with. Um, so what we do is um, we essentially do our labeling, and then all these these products that are close to the decision boundary, which you know has a which can be translated into the uh, probabilities that you end up getting, and generally probabilities being low and low, you know, well there's some math behind what really what low is. Um, uh, you you sort of identify those, and then we send them to Mechanical Turk for further labeling um, and put them back into our training set. So. Um, okay, so that's essentially sort of the logical bit of, uh, of, of, of our whole setup. So very brief, you know, how do we physically implement this? Um, so the feature extraction, I mean, you know, we have hundreds of millions of products. It's, sim it's a simply map operation, like for every training point you need to do a bit of cleaning, add the LDA feature, so, you know, there's, it's a simple map reduce task. Um, the training is one that I'll come to next, which is slightly more interesting. So for the training phase, you know, let's think of how many classifiers we really need to train. So let's say we have about 2,000 internal nodes, so 2,000 classifiers that we, we want to get at the end. Now, for every classifier, I said we're doing five-fold cross-validation. So we need to actually train this classifier five times you know, with five different sort of configurations of training and test data. Um, OK, so that's five times 2,000. Um, plus, you know, we choose to use or to search over about 20 um, uh, sets of hyperparameters. So that means there's about 200,000 classifiers that we need to run. And say the root one, you know, uses the whole data set, so it's quite an expensive calculation to do. You know, the one that says gaming consoles, well, there's really only like, you know, half a dozen gaming consoles in the world, so there's only, you know, five or six training points and five or six unlabeled points. Um, so, you know, that, that's very easy. But generally, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So kind of in pseudocode, um, the way we've kind of approached it is kind of the, or the extreme way we've initially approached it is, OK, so you, you, you run a map job over your whole data set. Um, and you look at a labeled data point. Um, and you look at its lineage. And for every subcategory in its lineage, you want to send that data point to the, uh, the internal node for classification. So that's what the first for loop does. Then for every hyperparameter, um, you also want to do, um, uh, you also want to um, uh, send that data point to that sort of classifier. So, you know, that's kind of another for loop. And then for every fold that you're going to do, in our case, five-fold cross-validation, you also want to send that data point to that particular fold. So what you end up with is, is kind of like in your mapper, you know, you take a data point and you send it to everybody who's going to, you know, train on that data point, which is, you know, a lot. Um, and then in your reduce phase, um, we then generally just take our YPT code, you know, put all the data into it, you know, we get the stats back out, and now we've trained all our models. So you know, it's very easy, you know, and MapReduce might be a bit of overkill here, but it's very easy to use kind of this MapReduce logic to um, just organize the way you're doing your computation. Um, so we do this using um, a Python tool uh, called Dumbo, which is, is a very good tool for that. 
Um, we get all our models out, and then when we actually, you know, decide, okay, these and these and these and these models are the, the sort of the best models that we can we can do. Then we need to go back and label the rest of our, you know, hundred million um, uh, data set. And the way we do that is we just take our data set, our hundreds of hundreds of millions of products, we chunk it up. You know, in our case, we do 128 chunks, um, and then we just take one simple machine um, uh, that goes through every chunk, and then you know follows down, you know, goes down the tree, and you know labels all the data points and puts, does the brute force sort of going down the tree and labeling every data point. So, so that's about it. Um, uh, there's a few extra things that we do, but I thought there's sort of a few um, things that I kind of wanted to highlight of, you know, what we did. So I have to say, you know, this, I've talked a lot about the training and the labeling, all that, because that's kind of the interesting bit from, a, from an algorithmic or machine learning point of view. To be perfectly honest, most of the time spent in developing this, we've spent in the feature engineering. Is like, okay, let's take the, the, the product's name and the description, how are we gonna clean it? Oh, shall we add LDA feature? Like those kind of decisions really make, you know, particularly with, in combination with the logistic regression classifier, which can you know, easily handle lots of features, made the biggest sort of impact in improving the performance of our system. So most of our time is spent in the feature engineering. The another thing that um, uh, I have wanted to do for the last you know two and a half years since this thing has been in production is, and there's this question of you know if you know that if you know the uh, the um, classifier that classifies things the root classifier so you have a good root classifier so you know what's electronics clothing you know uh, luggage etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Then there's a question of now if you're going to train the electronics classifier well do you want to train from scratch, like, are you going to just assume that you know nothing about the parameters? Perhaps, you know, no, there might be some relation between the parameters of the root classifier and the electronics classifier. For example, the words that were very indicative of, you know, distinguishing between clothing and electronics might not be um, uh, indicative at all, you know, of, for distinguishing between video and audio within the electronics classifier. And so being able to tie these parameters across the classifiers in the tree, you know, might allow you to sort of reuse some statistical power um, and get better results. Um, so that's a question that I haven't um, tackled yet, and there's sort of there's some really cool work that people have done, like how Domain has done some work around um, frustratingly easy domain adaptation, and you could imagine sort of every one of the classifier being sort of a separate domain that you want to solve. There's a lot of work that can that you know can be done there. Uh, I haven't tackled it, but it'd be an interesting question. Um, and then coming back to this idea between flattening and um, uh, and keeping your hierarchy. So this is really uh, uh, an interesting problem. There's again some results uh, from learning theory that where people have looked at this, where you know what do you want to do? You know if you have a um, a one classifier. Um, with you know lots of classes that could potentially be better than multiple classifiers because the multiple classifiers, if you say need to using Bayes rule chain you know the results of five classifiers together, so you're making five classification tasks. There's also five times the probability of making an error. And so if you have you know really good classifiers, you know they're they're you know 0.95 percent accurate. Um, you know, the, the, the chance if you use them five times in a row, the chance, the total accuracy is not, not going to be even close to 0.95. You know, it's going to be 0.95 to the power of five, which is going to, you know, it's, it's deteriorating very quickly, you know, as the tree becomes deeper. So there's kind of an interesting balance that you can strike between, you know, should I flatten or keep the hierarchy? Um, and I think there's some, some um, uh, there's something to be gained by you know at the the, the, the the high up the tree to use the hierarchy. So you know the root you definitely want to first split electronics away from clothing, away from you know luggage, etc. But then as you go down the tree, once you're in a very niche category, um, you know you might still have a subtree with say 16 leaves, but it might be better to then just use a multi-class classifier to reduce your error rate. And there's some learning theory uh, work around you know how to strike that balance, but you know we haven't implemented it just because it's it's a lot more complex. So that's about it. Um, I'll take any questions on 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 this this particular bit of work. So thank you. Okay, so, so the first question was um, why uh, we use logistic regression versus sort of an SVM or an IFBase or something. And again, I, I, there it might be better to use something else. We just wanted something 
where we could easily try to add new features and you know play with the features and do feature engineering. I mean, in my experience, that's been you know where you can really gain a lot um, uh, in performance by you know doing more feature engineering rather than focusing on the particular algorithm, which is why we went for logistic regression and there were good tools available. Um, and then your second question was that there's an alternative. Uh, um, software, yeah, I, I'm, you know, there's lots of, you know, I think different software around, um, uh, and you know, I think right now, I think WAPT definitely has a special place in my heart. Scikit-Learn has another special place in my heart. Um, so, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things that I would consider using, and it's, it's really, yeah, it's just a matter of what you know I'm used to or not. Question in the back. <clears throat> yes, uh, so that's good. So the question is whether we benchmark this against uh, the full flat, um, full flattening of the hierarchy. Yes, we did that. Um, and the full flattening of the hierarchy, um, uh, well, that's very easy to do. Um, and you know, we did that at first um, uh, on kind of our initial training set, um, and we got better results with um, you know doing kind of an initial version of the hierarchy, which is why we decided to spend the effort in doing the hierarchical thing. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I'm not 100% sure where, you know, I'm sure it's problem dependent as well, but where the balance is between when do you flatten, when do you go for the, you know, hierarchy. But, you know, obviously comparing this to a f completely flattening is very easy to do, so. Um, so the metric we use for that, yeah, and that's a very good question, and I sort of skipped over that, is all the cross-validation that we show is local. You know, that's just about choosing which local classifier. And so one of the things that we do, um, is you know we do t start out with taking a whole bunch of labeled data completely out of the system, and then look at the performance of um, the um, uh, you know the actual performance of labeling you know complete you know the complete labeling. Now it's very hard to do because these these the um, you don't get very good accuracy. Um, because, for example, if you label an iPad case, you know, iPad cases end up in electronics accessories as well as luggage and phone accessories. So there are actually two, there's two or three nodes that are actually reasonable. Uh, and if your classifier does a good job by, you know, dropping in one of them, but your label's the other one, then, you, you know, you make a mistake and that's very costly. So, you know, and we haven't spent a lot of time in figuring out, you know, a different cost function for that. But, you know, we do look at that as a metric, but it's not the most important one because we don't think it's a very good one. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. Where does the tree come from? It's a very simple answer. We use the tree from Google Shopping because um, it's, you know, it's widely used. So it's a fork or you know, not even a fork, a copy of the Google Shopping hierarchy because um, it's, it's a common one and we just you know, one, yeah. So we don't explore that ourselves. That is a good question. Uh, we didn't do that, no. We, we literally just run LDA over our whole um, product catalog. And the reason we start, we thought it might be a good idea is that, you know, it helps with things like, um, you know, uh, you know syn word synonyms, like, you know, rather than having two separate words, you know, LDA will pick up their sort of synonym like, and then, you know, there's a feature for that. Um, but I think that would be a really interesting thing is to do hierarchical LDA over the tree. Um, yeah, I think that would be a cool idea. <laughs>